Welcome. We are in Peacemakers number five, actually, already. And um, we're talking today about the, the possibility of overlooking an offense. Is it possible to overlook an offense? And what role does this have in the uh, process of peacemaking? Um, you know, when conflict arises, we usually ask ourselves, is this really worth fighting over? Uh, Proverbs 19 says, It is to a man's glory to overlook an offense. 1 Peter 4, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. And Ephesians 4, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Uh, I would love for you to interact at this point and uh, just pause the video for a few seconds and, um, and do this for me. Uh, make a list of three offenses that you could overlook and three offenses that you could not. I hope you were able to make a list either on a piece of paper or, or mentally in your mind, we're going to come back to that list at the end uh, for a piece of application. Um, our main text is from Philippians 4, and the second verse, I think, is kind of the key of the passage. And the second verse of, of that chapter is, I appeal to Euodia and to Syntyche to agree in the Lord. This is Paul writing to the church of Philippi. Our big idea in this, um, in this message is that a peacemaker overlooks minor offenses. And I, I believe that Philippians 4 uh, shows us five ways that we can do that. Uh, this very familiar passage. Here are the five ways. Rejoice in the Lord always. Reveal your gentleness to all. Replace anxiety with prayer. Regain your perspective and repeat what you've learned. Now, I've changed some of the wording uh, a little bit here and so on, but I will say that, um, that some of this outline comes from the book, The Peacemaker by Ken Sandy. And uh, so I uh, am in his debt for his great work on this topic. And so, um, you know, with peacemaking, our biggest and best example is God, of course. Psalm 103 uh, says this, The Lord is compassionate and merciful. He is patient and demonstrates great loyal love. He does not always accuse and does not stay angry. Aren't you glad for that? <laughs> he does not deal with us as our sins deserve. He does not repay us as our misdeeds deserve. What a gracious and compassionate God we serve, right? Now, I think we would agree that not all offenses are sins. But how do I know what rises to the level of a problem? Every one of us is different, and so this calls for a discernment. Ken Sand suggests that under two conditions, an offense could be overlooked. Number one, the offense has not created a wall between the two of you. Number two, uh, the offense should not be causing serious harm to God's reputation, harm to others, or to the offender. Sand says this, As you examine your role in a conflict, it is helpful to look for two types of fault. First, you may have an overly sensitive attitude which causes you to be offended too easily by others. Second, you may have contributed to the conflict through your own sinful behavior. Matthew 7 says this, Why do you see the speck in your brother's eye, but fail to see the beam of wood in your own? Or how can you say to your brother, Let me remove that speck from your eye? while there is a beam in your own. You hypocrite, first remove the beam from your own eye, and then you can clearly see to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now here's the, here's the idea here. Y yes, you get the log, the, the big thing out of your own eye, 
<laughs> whatever is whatever is your fault, whatever is your part of it. The passage doesn't forbid loving correction, though. It doesn't say don't take a speck out of your brother's eye. It says first, get the log out of your own eye. So it forbids premature and improper correction, right? But here's the thing. A peacemaker overlooks minor offenses. Here's the passage where Paul is calling for a new attitude in the Philippian church. Philippians 4 verses 2 to 9. I appeal to Euodia and to Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I say also to you, true companion, help them. They have struggled together in the gospel ministry along with me and Clement and my other co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let everyone see your gentleness. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. Instead, in every situation, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, tell your requests to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is worthy of respect, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if something is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. And what you learned and received and heard and saw in me, do these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, some of these verses are very well known, but it's interesting, I think, to see kind of the, the context of what Paul is writing. Paul is making an, a direct appeal to these two people who are at odds with each other, and then he calls for those in the fellowship to help them. Um, a peacemaker overlooks minor offenses, and that's what Paul is calling the church to do, calling these two what I believe are two women uh, calling these two workers to do. The first way to do that is to rejoice in the Lord always. We, we saw verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. You know, uh, Laura and I have recently been feeling the, the weight of our own kids' struggle to grow up in their faith and just grow up, period. Some days it's crushing, honestly. We've been learning to lift our eyes and to remember all that we have and all that we are in the Lord. And I think that's one of the keys of this verse is rejoice in the Lord always. And so we can always thank God and rejoice in our salvation and all that God has done, and all that he is doing in us, and by faith, all that he will do, right? I love uh, John Piper's book called The Future Grace, and I read it a number of years ago, but it has this idea that, try to imagine how much grace has come to each of us to this point, from the beginning of time till now, and it includes everything, all the way through your family to now, uh, including the coming of Christ and the cross and the resurrection and so on, all the way till now, it's all God's grace. But then turn and look into the future, a future that will never end, eternity, forever and ever and ever, far beyond our own imaginations, and all the grace that is yet to come forever. It's all the grace of God. And, and he loves talking about that. I, I really enjoyed reading about it and thinking about trying to imagine how much grace is still to come. Rejoice in the Lord always. Because a peacemaker is, over, is able to overlook minor offenses in this way. Well, the second thing he says is, reveal your gentleness to all. Verse 5 says, let everyone see your gentleness. The Lord is near. Perhaps you've heard the phrase, a gentle answer turns away wrath. It's, it's amazing how 
uh, not just words, but tone of voice can be used in such a powerful way where um, I, uh, you or I can uh, respond in a kind and gentle tone with kind and gentle words and, and a situation is just diffused, right? I confess that there have been a number of times in my life where uh, unrelated pressures from work or whatever have been building up in my life and I have um, then in turn I've kind of brought down harshness um, and, and anger down on Laura or down on my kids. Um, and it's been for uh, not a large offense. They do some small little thing and then boom, reveal your gentleness to all. Because in that moment of revelation of gentleness, which is really the gentleness of Jesus through you, through us, we're able to overlook minor offenses in that way. Number three, replace anxiety with prayer. Do not be anxious about anything. Instead, in every situation, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, tell your requests to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The word instead uh, in this verse I love because he's talking about a replacement, right? Do this instead of this. Instead of being anxious, be thankful and present your prayers in thankfulness, right? And that's another key of, this, of these two verses, with thanksgiving, because it's really hard to be anxious and thankful at the same time. Have you, have you ever tried that? I, I, I cannot be both anxious and thankful at the same time. So that's a great encouragement. So replace your anxiety with thankfulness. When we do that, something supernatural happens. Peace from God surrounds our hearts and minds and sets up a watch. It guards, it guards us. Uh, Proverbs 14, 25 says uh, that out of the fear of the Lord comes great confidence. And that's part of what this guard does. It makes me think that, that replacing anxiety with prayer and then our next point, uh, regaining our perspective, they need to go hand in hand because when I have confidence in the greatness of my God, I can let go of the anxiety. Praise God. Number four is to regain your perspective. And it's taken from verse eight. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is worthy of respect, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, commendable. If something is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Once the anxious thoughts are replaced, then out of that thanksgiving and peace, we can begin to take command of our mind. Have you ever thought about that? Taking command of your mind and telling yourself what to think. That's how joy can be commanded, right? Uh, in another place, Paul says, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Think about this verse in light of overlooking a minor offense. What if I inserted my opponent's name into this sequence? For example, let's say that uh, Laura and I have had a fight and, um, and uh, I'm struggling with my attitude and, and struggling to let go of the offense, this small thing. What if I, what if I then put Laura's name into this verse? And it would, it would be something like this. Whatever is true about Laura Whatever is worthy of respect in Laura, whatever is just about Laura, whatever is pure about her, whatever is lovely about Laura, whatever is commendable about her, if something is excellent in her or, or praiseworthy in her, think about these things. You try that the next time you're offended in some small way. We regain our perspective. And then uh, number five, repeat or practice what you've learned. Verse five, Paul says, what you've learned, received, and heard, and saw in me, do these things, and the God of peace will be with you. 
So, once again, Paul places knowing before doing, believing before doing, and doing as a part of the learning process. Whatever you've seen in me, you've heard in me, you received it, now do it. You do it, right? This is a piece of us learning, I believe, uh, learning how to walk by faith, for sure. A question I have uh, with regard to this is, do you have a, a Paul in your life, someone who you're watching and receiving from and, and um, learning from? A related question is, are you Paul for someone? Being an example and saying, hey, imitate me as I'm imitating Christ. A peacemaker overlooks minor offenses. I want to read a story uh, from the peacemaker uh, that talks about how to do this and how to weigh the cost involved when there has been an offense. The principle of relinquishing rights to advance God's kingdom was illustrated in one of my first conciliation cases. Ted worked for a government agency. As a new believer, he was excited about his salvation and wanted to have a positive witness for Christ among his co-workers. Ted and his supervisor, Joan, had never gotten along well, partly because Ted continually tried to tell her how to run her department. <laughs> His enthusiasm for Christ provoked her further. As her frustration toward Ted increased, Joan gave him particularly difficult work assignments, even though she knew he had a back problem. Eventually, he injured his back and had to leave work for several months. Although he received some disability benefits, Ted lost several thousand dollars due to missed wages and additional medical expenses. As a result, he filed a lawsuit against Joan and the agency. By the time Ted came to see me, he had returned to work and the lawsuit was moving slowly through the court system. During our first conversation, Ted and I identified several ways he had contributed to the conflict with Joan. Seeing his own fault more clearly, Ted began to consider settling the lawsuit by accepting the $5,000 the agency had offered him a few days earlier. Although his damages exceeded that amount, his attorney advised him to accept the settlement. On the other hand, several of Ted's friends were encouraging him to demand more money or to continue the litigation. A few days later, Ted surprised me by saying that he was going to drop his lawsuit without accepting the settlement offer. The more he had reflected on his own fault in the matter, the less comfortable he felt about accepting money from the agency. At the same time, he had concluded that laying down his right to restitution would be an effective way to demonstrate the mercy and forgiveness that he himself had received from God. The next morning, Ted went to talk with Joan. He admitted that he had been disrespectful, arrogant, and rude, and he asked for her forgiveness. Joan seemed suspicious of his motives and said little in response. Ted went on to explain that he had forgiven her for ordering him to move the heavy boxes and that he was dropping his lawsuit. Finally, he said he hoped that they could start over in their relationship and learn to work together in the future. More suspicious than ever, Joan asked why he was doing this. He replied, I became a Christian a year ago and God is slowly helping me to face up to a lot of my faults, including those that contributed to the problems between you and me. God has also shown me that his love and forgiveness for me is absolutely free and that I can do nothing to earn or deserve it. Since he has done that for me, I decided I wanted to act the same way toward you. Well, Joan was amazed and humbled by his response in the end, and word began to spread around his office. Here's the end. Three years later, I asked Ted whether he regretted his decision to give up the settlement. No, he said, that was the best $5,000 I ever spent. God used those events to bring several people to Christ. He also helped me to overcome some major sins in my life. I only wish I had settled it more quickly. So yes, we, we do have to count the cost when there has been an offense, but consider the cost of an unresolved conflict. And here's the thing, overlooking something is, n is not a passive thing. It is an active thing, right? You, you commit to don't talk about it. You commit to not dwell on it. 
you commit to not let it grow into bitterness inside of you. All right, as we come to a close then, um, I want you to think about um, one of the offenses that you can't let go of. At the beginning, we, we um, thought about three offenses that you could overlook and three offenses that you can't overlook. I want you to choose one of those that you can't let go of, and I want you to take it through um, these five steps. Here's an, here's an example. Um, let's say my family member is always late for everything, and I, and I just can't let it go. How will, I, how will I deal with this? How do I rejoice in the Lord in this situation? Well, perhaps... Um, I need to change my focus and change my attitude and check my attitude. Am I still able to rejoice in my salvation in all that God is and all that he is in me and all that I am in him? Can I still do that? That's the first step, to rejoice in the Lord. How do I make sure my gentleness stays gentle? Well, perhaps to remember that the Lord is in me and the Lord is in her or him. Because that verse says, the Lord is near. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. The Lord is working in me. The Lord is working in you. Let's come together about this. Well, how do I not worry about this issue? How can I let the anxiety go? How can I instead turn it into the prayer of thanksgiving? What can I begin thinking that will help me to gain perspective and to keep a proper perspective in this thing that I can't let go of? We are called sometimes as peacemakers to let go of minor offenses, to overlook those. And we can. We can do that by the grace of God flowing through our lives to other people. May we be people of grace and power, the power of God for the glory of God. Amen.